I often have viewers saying that their wine has finished fermentation way too fast, or at least they think it was too fast. So today we're gonna to talk about some factors influencing the speed or rate of fermentation in your wine. The rate of fermentation is especially important if you're making a red wine, because you're often trying to maximize that skin contact time. And of course you can leave the wine on the skins a little bit after the wine runs dry, but you lose that CO2 blanket, things start to get a little bit riskier. So if you can just kind of keep it bubbling for longer, that's often a pretty good thing. So there's probably five or six factors that go into the speed of fermentation. Some are like extremely important, whereas others really small influence. So I'll kind of go through those in order of most influence on speed to least influence on speed. And you can kind of try to steer your fermentation as you want to. The first and probably the most important factor is gonna be the temperature of your must when you're fermenting. A red wine you'll ferment between about 70 Fahrenheit to 86 Fahrenheit. A white wine you can push all the way down or go into the low 50s and the rate is dramatically different. Even when you go from say 75 to 85 it could it could finish three times faster by doing that little 10 degree jump in fermentation temperature. Temperature is a tricky one though because at higher temperatures you're also getting a lot more extraction. So what I try to do is ferment hot when I want to really be extracting and then cool the must down. As fermentation goes on, you start to get more alcohol and you, you just, you're extracting things that you might not necessarily want as much like seed tannins later in the fermentation. At a temperature of say 86 Fahrenheit, if you ran just a flat fermentation temperature, you would ferment dry most musts in probably four days. That's pretty fast. Um, my general profile is gonna start something like this. I'm gonna heat the wine up just enough to get that yeast to start, which is 65 to 70. I let the wine warm up naturally and give it a little bit of a boost for those first three or four days. And for half a day, maybe even a whole day, I'd like to see that temperature peak up to around 86 or 80, 70, 87 degrees to really extract well. And what you're extracting early on when the wine is mostly sugar and water is you're gonna extract those fruitier compounds and not so much of the harsh tannins that you're gonna get later. Another way that the temperature can affect the speed of fermentation is if you were to completely overheat the wine. If you were running your temperature up and you didn't pay attention too good, um, say you hit 95 degrees Fahrenheit or even 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you can basically wipe that yeast out and stall the fermentation out, which it'll probably start back up as you cool back down, but it's gonna be a little sluggish. It's probably gonna create a lot of hydrogen sulfide, which is not something that you want. The temperature of the fermentation is really pretty easy to control, especially for a smaller batch. You can, of course, let the yeast naturally heat it up if you're trying to go for a warmer fermentation. Or what I'd often do is I'll throw a little space heater on the must just to get it heated up. Sometimes I'll throw a seed heater around it with a bungee cord if I'm just doing a small bucket of grapes. If I'm trying to do the opposite, I'm trying to cool the wine down, I'll take frozen one gallon jugs, two liter bottles, little juice bottles, things like that. I'll throw them in the must and bring the temperature down where I need it. If I'm fermenting a white wine and I'm actually trying to ferment cool to preserve those aromas, what I'll do is I'll put the, I'll often ferment in a carboy if it's a white wine, leave a little bit of headspace, and I'll put it in a bin, which I'll fill with water, say six inches deep, and then same thing, I'll throw frozen bottles into that bin and just kind of keep the temperature nice and low in the 55 to 65 degree range. And again, just really preserve those aromas for a white wine. The next thing that's gonna influence the speed greatly is gonna be how much sugar's in that wine or that, that juice when you start. 
So a red wine, you could have anywhere from, you know, 23 to, I've seen as high as 27 or 28% sugar. And those are gonna often take a little bit longer to ferment than say a wine like a white wine or, you know, really light red wine that might have say 22% sugar. The reasons this is gonna be a little bit slower are gonna be starting off, you've got a lot of sugar. Sometimes that's a little bit hard for a yeast to start in a really high sugar or high gravity as you'd call it must. So that's gonna kind of slow things down. Things will cruise through the middle. The other thing that's gonna happen is as the alcohol begins to climb, that just becomes a little bit more of a stressful environment for the yeast, kind of again, slowing things down and there's just more sugar for it to eat. So you could get quite a few extra days out of a 26 or 27% sugar ferment as compared to a 23 or 24% sugar. Next on the list is gonna be pH, which is a measure of the strength of the acids in the wine. So a low pH is gonna be more acidic than a high pH. And when speaking in wine terms, a really low pH would be something like 3.0, really high pH, maybe 3.8. And the way the scale works is it's logarithmic. So a pH of 3.0 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 4.0 and 100 times more acidic than a pH of 5.0. So a little shift on that scale is actually pretty substantial. And what's happening by shifting on that scale, if you shift down, meaning more acidic, is it's gonna be just a little bit more of a harsh environment for any little microbe to act. So in this case, yeast is the little fungi that you're trying to encourage. And you know, at a pH for a red wine of say 3.5, which is a reasonable starting point, sometimes 3.4, it's gonna, the pH is really not gonna inhibit it too much. Whereas sometimes you've got these white wines that you start out all the way down at 3.0, which can have a small influence on the speed or rate of that fermentation, meaning it's gonna slow it down as you get more acidic. Next is going to be the available nitrogen to that yeast. So yeast really, really likes nitrogen. You can add nitrogen a few different ways. Naturally, you're gonna get some on the grapes as they come in. You can add it in the form of DAP, diammonium phosphate, which is basically like candy to yeast. And in a way that's good, but in a way that's bad. It's good to recover a fermentation if it's struggling, but it's bad because the yeast just runs right through that nitrogen. The other one's gonna be your more complex nutrients like Fermade K, which include a little bit of DAP, but also include a lot more maybe slowly accessible forms of nitrogen. And you can see when you add these nutrients to the must that it, it fires that yeast up pretty good. You'll often see a spike in temperature. And if you're not careful, it'll bubble that fermentation right over. Bubbling's probably more because of the CO2 grabbing the little dusty particles and it is actually a ramp up that aggressively. But regardless, you're seeing a pretty, pretty quick change in the rate of fermentation as you feed a, a must that may have otherwise been a little bit low on nitrogen. Sometimes when you get your grapes, they'll give you a number, it's called YAN, um, yeast assimilable nitrogen. And this is gonna basically tell you how much nitrogen is available to that yeast in that must. And if you've got a high number, say 200 plus, you might not really need to feed it much. Whereas if you have a low number like 50, you're probably gonna know yeast might need a little bit of nitrogen. And another thing, if you don't feed your yeast, um, say you don't have enough nitrogen in the must and you don't feed your yeast, a couple things can happen aside from it just fermenting really slow. The yeast under stressful conditions like that will actually often create a little bit of hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten egg smell that a fermentation can get, and also volatile acidity, like your acetic acid or acetaldehyde. So things that you're really trying to minimize in the wine. So usually I'll 
give the wine just a little bit of a boost, even if it's not showing signs of stress. Next is going to be air contact. So yeast has a couple ways that it can consume sugars. It can consume sugars in the presence of oxygen or in anaerobic conditions like this CO2 filled fermentation that you have. When it, when it consumes it in contact with air, that would be called aerobic respiration. And what that does is it's much more of an energy restorative way for that yeast to consume that sugar. So it'll multiply easier and quicker and those yeast will be re really pretty energized to keep on chugging along. Now the problem with aerobic respiration versus your more anaerobic fermentation is it's not actually creating alcohol, it's gonna create water and CO2 as a byproduct. So, I mean, there's no situation where you have so much air that you wouldn't actually create alcohol, but you're gonna have a little bit lower. And I'll actually use this to my advantage sometimes. For instance, if I've got a wine that is really high sugar coming in, like 27% sugar, which I happen to have fermenting right now, I'll try to give that wine as much air as I can give it early on, aside from seeing any oxidative issues, which you're really rarely, rarely ever gonna see during fermentation. So I'll do that because I'm trying to drive that alcohol down a little bit so I don't have like a 16% alcohol wine. I mentioned that you're not gonna usually see oxidation during fermentation aside from byproducts of a stressed yeast. And that's because the process of fermentation is pretty reductive. So it's kind of naturally sort of the opposite of oxidation. It's consuming every little piece of oxygen that you put in there and actually leaving that must pretty oxygen starved, which can cause its own problems. Like I said, hydrogen sulfide, later leading to something called mercaptan, which is a big wine flaw that you just, you don't really wanna to have to deal with if you can prevent it. Next, and this one maybe should have gone a little bit higher on the list, is going to be the yeast strain. So if you're gonna choose a cultured yeast strain, which by the way, these are usually strains that have been isolated from the wild. They're not like a chemically formulated thing. But the yeast strain will pretty often somewhat substantially affect the speed of fermentation. So you've got some notoriously slow strains out there like your Assmannhausen, which is a German strain, that will ferment nice and slow, which is something you really want in a red wine often, as I said. And then you've got some really pretty aggressive strains out there like your um, EC1118 will rip through a fermentation pretty quick. And you often want something kind of in the middle. Lately I've been using a lot of your Lalvin BDX, which is kind of in the middle. And the benefit of that is, you know, if you go too slow, sometimes it means that yeast can be a little bit stressed or it needs a lot of nitrogen to stop from producing VA volatile acids or um, hydrogen sulfide. If you go too fast, you just don't get enough skin contact time. So I kind of like to sit in the middle somewhere with some of these moderate paced fermenters that are also just relatively low maintenance, low risk of something going off course. One last factor that will also influence the rate somewhat is going to be the size of inoculation when you get that fermentation started. If you just sprinkled the yeast on the top, it could take a while to get started and actually in a lot of cases, the yeast that you think is starting might not be the one because a wild strain that came in on the grapes might be what started it versus you know if you take it the other route you make a monster yeast starter which i often will do just to make sure that i get a good healthy start well you're inoculating with a huge huge cell count which can really reduce that lag phase where the fermentation is getting started so what i'll often do is i will make that monster starter but instead of just mixing it all through the wine, I'll just kind of let it float on the surface until I start to see some actual bubbles form and then I'll mix it through the wine. So it generally takes, mm, I would say 12 hours to start to see good signs of fermentation and it'll take probably 36 hours to just really, really see that cap rising on that red wine. I hope 
that I helped you out in some way here. And it's, it's an interesting thing because the time does matter. You do want to really extend that out as long as you can on a red wine, unless you're trying to make a lighter, easy drinking red wine. But it can be also a little bit of a balancing act because you go too far one way, you can create some problems. You can go too far the other way, you can create some problems. If you want to see bonus content, swing by my Patreon page patreon.com slash make wine, and you can always get free content on my website, smartwinemaking.com. If you have any comments, make sure to mention in the comments section below, or if you have any tricks that I may not have mentioned, always love to hear from other winemakers. Thanks for watching.